Yes, Bible study. Bible study. Y'all um, remember what we were talking about last week? The Bible. The Bible. Very good. We were talking about is hell a reality? Yes. And today we are continuing on with that theme because we want to talk more about hell itself, not the reality of going there, not the reality of being sent there, because we're not. It's not a reality, is it? Um, but we're going to talk about the reality of hell. So, before we begin, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful sunny day, another great day. Oh, you're so good to us, Lord. We thank you, Father, for your word, for all of the things that are in there, the, the knowledge of you. And uh, it's important to know the Bible, but it's far more important to know you. And the only way we can get to know you is by knowing the word of God. Thank you so much, Lord, for the study tonight. I pray you'd pour out your spirit upon us and teach us as we read, as we learn, as we grow. We thank you so much. Father, be with all those who couldn't be here tonight because of illness. Be with all those who couldn't be here tonight because of uh, other reasons. Whatever that is, Lord, you know you're in charge. We pray for Aura as she continues to try to deliver this baby. And, and uh, though the child is no longer uh, there in, uh, in soul, um, we pray, Father, for Aura that you would give her strength to get through this issue, through this problem. We pray for the family that you'd give them peace. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Alrighty. So, the reality of hell. So, some people, well, like we were talking last week, a lot of people are, are doubting the reality of hell. They're denying the reality of hell because they want to deny the reality of hell. They don't want to believe there is such a place. But it's important that we always remember that no matter how much we want to doubt something, it doesn't change the fact that that's the way it is. In, in, in this world where relativism seems to be ruling, it doesn't matter what, what you think or what I think, it's what reality is that's important. And there is an absolute truth. There's always an absolute truth, absolutely. I just made a truthful statement right there. I knew you all saw that. God created mankind for the best of all worlds. He created us for the best of this earth, this world we live in, and he created us for the best of the world to come. He created us for these things. He's given people the ability, this is so important. He's given mankind the ability of free choice. Free choice. Some people deny free choice, but it's really important that we, we understand free choice because we can decide what to do. We, we have a choice, we can decide. If there, if there wasn't a hell, we wouldn't have free choice. Because if there wasn't a hell, we'd have to go to heaven, whether we wanted to or not. Right now, we have a choice. We have free will. We can choose where we want to go. You want to go to hell, you want to go to heaven. It's your choice. So it's important that we understand free choice. God will triumph over evil when it is the perfect time. Look at John 16, 33. John 16, 33. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. You will have tribulation. You will have tribulation. You will. But take heart, because I've overcome the world. So we will have tribulation, but the tribulation is only for a short time. It's while we live here on earth. But, but we should rejoice. We should, we should take heart as we go through this because Jesus has already overcome that problem. So there's something better to come. So um, love is the greatest good. We learned that from Matthew 22. But love is impossible without free choice. This free choice thing, you're going to hear about this tonight. Free will, free choice. Love is impossible without free will. My wife can't force me to love her. She's tried. It didn't work. No. I choose to love my wife. And from the very beginning of the Word of God, everything is a choice. You, you, you read the Bible and you look for choice. Adam and Eve were put in a garden. They didn't, they didn't have only one choice in the garden. They had two choices. 
They, they, could, they could eat of all the trees except for this one. There had to be a choice because that showed their love for God. Although their love failed and, and love continues to fail, we have a choice. And, and so love can't be forced or coerced. It has to be a choice. People don't fall in love and fall out of love. They choose to love and they choose not to love. Comes a time when a divorce happens, it's not because, oh, we've grown apart, we've fallen out of, no. We chose not to love each other anymore. That's the way it goes. He chose to love me not, I chose to love her not, whatever the story is, someone chose not to love. So, um, uh, God gave mankind free choice. We can choose good, or we can choose evil. There's a choice. If people say, why would God allow evil into the world? Well, if we didn't have evil, then you wouldn't have a choice. Without choices, we're robots. We have no choice, so we don't have to, we don't have to make a decision. We don't have to show obedience. We don't have to show, because there's no choice. Choice is very important. So instead of destroying humanity to get rid of evil, God decided to give people the greatest choice and for the greatest good of all. So without hell, heaven becomes a default position. If we don't have a hell, then everybody's going to heaven, and therefore it's not a choice, therefore I don't have to love God, I don't have to accept His ways, because I'm going there anyway. There's no choice, there's no free will. It's absolutely taken away. This is the place, heaven, heaven, heaven is a place of eternal bliss. It's the place where the redeemed, that's us, the followers of Jesus Christ, it's the place where we'll spend eternity worshiping God in His presence. Why then would anyone want to spend an eternity? Why would anybody want to spend an eternity in God's presence if they've spent their whole life here on earth rejecting God and turning away from God? It doesn't make sense to not have a hell. Because those people don't want to be with God. If they wanted to be with God, they could have been with Him now. We're with God now as followers of Jesus. God dwells in us. We have joy and peace and abundant life. We have it now. It's not something for the future. We have it now. So we get to go through this life with God. If, if, if there was no, if, 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 there, if we live our life here without God, then why all of a sudden at the end of our life we want to spend eternity with God? We don't. So, so free choice is an important thing. Heaven loses some of its attributes if hell does not exist. Heaven wouldn't be what it is if hell didn't exist. First, first thing, without hell, one must get rid of free will. Okay, there is no choice if there's no hell. You don't choose between heaven and hell. You have to take heaven. Even if you hate God so much, You'd never wanted to be with God this whole life. You're going to have to spend eternity with it. It doesn't make a lot of sense. And of course, it leads to more relativism. I can do what I want to do. You can do what you want to do. You might think something's good. I might think it's bad. It doesn't matter because we're all going to end up in heaven anyway. So number one, without hell, we have to get rid of free will. Number two, if there's no hell, then there's no difference between good and evil. There's no difference. Why would I do good stuff if I could do evil stuff and enjoy it and still end up in heaven? There would be no difference between good and evil. With good and evil come reward and punishment. If we don't have hell, there's no punishment. So everything is reward. So even when people are evil, they're going to be rewarded. Number three, if there's no hell, then Jesus also is not who he claims to be. Because people wouldn't need a savior. He he claimed to be the rescuer of the world, to take away, I came to seek and save the lost. Who cares? Why would it make any difference? There's no help. You're not saving anybody from anything. So Jesus wouldn't be who he claimed to be, so he'd be a liar. And number four, faith is truly vain if there's no hell because Christ's death was a terrible mistake. Your God died for no reason at all because there's no hell. So hell has to exist. The Bible teaches that both heaven and hell are very real places. And that each person will eventually spend eternity in one of these places. Most of what we know about hell, we've learned right from the mouth of Jesus. He spoke more about hell than he ever spoke about heaven. 
So we're going to look at a couple of passages here. Well, let's look at John 5, 28 to 29. John chapter 5, verse 28 to 29. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. They'll come out. Those who have done good are going to rise to resurrection life. Those who have done evil will rise to judgment. Resurrection of judgment. Those who have who are, are righteous, those who have, have done good, and, and it doesn't mean good works. We don't want to... This is the problem when you take one passage of Scripture. Someone could take that and say, look, if I've done good, I'm going to have resurrection life. I'm going to live eternally in heaven. Doing good, if we read the rest of Scripture, it teaches that doing good is doing those things that God preordained before time for us to do. We didn't do them because they're good things to do. We did them because we want to please our Heavenly Father. But we don't have resurrection life because we did good things. We do good things because we have resurrection life. Is that okay? Everyone good with that? I am never a promoter of works. We are saved by Christ's righteousness alone. Nothing we did. There's nothing good that we've done that's going to save us. So these, these, they're going to come out of the grave and some will rise to resurrection life. Some will rise to eternal destruction, to judgment. Scripture's main description of hell is a place of punishment. I'm, I'm not going to look these up, but Matthew 5, Matthew 24, Mark 9, Luke 16, 2 Thessalonians 1, Hebrew 10, James 4, James 5, 2 Peter 2, Jude 13 to 23, and Revelation 20. In all these places where there's a description of hell, it's a description of a place of punishment. The Bible talks a lot about hell, so we must understand... Uh, what hell is, according to the scripture, and according to the scripture, the majority of, of, of scripture would tell you that it's a place of punishment, eternal punishment. So those in hell are in an inescapable, indescribable torment for eternity. It's also a, a conscious punishment, and it, it's everlasting. A person can't escape from hell. There's, you hear people say all the time, man, you know, there's, there's like a second choice. There's a second chance. There's a time that comes when we can choose. We can get out of hell. It's kind of like they, they treat hell like the purgatory, where you go there to purge yourself of your sins, and then you're off to heaven. And that's not true. There's nowhere in the Bible that says that. I'm talking fast, aren't I? Because I'm getting exhausted. <laughs> okay, sorry, I'll slow down. Anybody have any questions or concerns? Did anybody catch anything I said? Should I start over? Some people were writing the verses down. You might want to read oh, them. Oh, you can watch the video. Okay. Yeah, they're all on the video. So, so when that comes out to you, or um, you mean those verses that I was reading about the description of hell? Yeah, I did those fast. Okay, okay, Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Um, Matthew 24. Um, Mark 9. Luke 16. Does it sound like a bingo game? <laughs> bingo. Under the Luke 16. <laughs> 2 Thessalonians 1. Hebrews 10. James 4. James 5. 2 Peter 2. Jude verses 13 to 23. And Revelation 20. If you look up in your concordance, just look up hell. Do you know what a concordance is, y'all? They used to put those in Bibles. Do they still do that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah you can look up, and, and you look up the word hell, and it'll show you all the references in the Bible. Read them. Spend time and, and read those references to hell, and you'll see they're all, the majority of them refer to, uh, to a place of punishment, eternal, eternal punishment. So people will use uh, their will to suppress what they know about God. So the Bible tells us that God's been showing himself throughout history. You know, when people say, I, I don't know about God, he never, you know, I never seen him, I, never, I don't know anything about him. Um, God has been showing himself in history, throughout history. It, it's his story. And, and, and God shows himself in creation. I mean, everything that's created. When, when you look at the, at the uh, talk to Bill about fish. Seriously, talk to Bill. Bill's been Bill's been out there spending billions of hours out on the lake, 
and, and he studies a fish, and he, 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 he's telling me stuff about fish. I had no idea. But, but when you listen to what he's saying, just about fish, it's absolutely incredible. The way that they, the way that they move and the, the way that they, 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 they eat and the way that they, they hide places and they know when the water temperature is changing and they move. It just it blows my mind because I know nothing about fish. But you just, that's just one part of creation. And when you look at, at all of these things that create, well, even the human body, like people tell you, I'm sure that there's nobody in this fellowship that uh, follows evolutionary theory because it's so ridiculous to think that these things could happen by mistake when, uh, when uh, definitely there's a design, you've got to have a designer. So um, people know that there's a God. And, 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 and whatever they call him, whatever they refer to him as, they know that something supernatural exists. And, and even people who are atheists, atheists just don't want to talk about it, so they say they're atheists, but they know there's something else, there has to be something else. God has always shown himself. But people have willfully rejected God throughout history. They've always willfully rejected God. If God's wrath is revealed from heaven against the godless and the unrighteous people who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. That's Romans chapter 1. They suppress the truth. They, they, they know there's something true, but they suppress it. They don't want, they don't want to discuss it. They, they just want to put it away. And, uh, and Jesus said, this then is the judgment. It's John 3, 19. This then is the judgment. The light has come into the world, but the people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. They, they, they knew there was a God. They know about God. They know there's something else. But because their deeds are evil, they don't want to be exposed by this light. So they suppress that knowledge. They, they, they put it away. They, I don't want to talk about it. I'm an atheist. I don't want to, don't want to deal with it. But sin is present, hell is real, and humans choose them both in lieu of God. They choose hell and they choose sin because they don't want to deal with God. They suppress it. People are not free to reinvent, invent, uh, to revise or to change biblical truths or doctrines just because they want things to go their way. They don't have the right to do that. So we must not evaluate truth based on what's popular, based on what's politically correct, based on what's preferred. We can't do that. Truth must be evaluated on, on the basis of God's word. That's what we have to base truth on. So, let me jump down here. This apologist, J.P. Moreland, he says this. He says, it's wrong to think God is simply a loving being especially if you mean loving in the sense that most Americans use the word today. Yes, God is compassionate. He's a compassionate being. But he's also a just, moral, and pure being. People always talk about God as a, God lovingly offers forgiveness. And, and, and it's true. It's true. But his forgiveness must be accepted. He doesn't just offer forgiveness. And, and people receive it automatically. You have to accept it. And in order to accept God's forgiveness, you have to come to a place where you can say, I'm a sinner. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to do. I'm, I'm hoping that everybody in this room has done it. You know, we've come to that place where we realize God is, God is right when he says, all have sinned. We all have sinned. We all got to be able to say, I'm a sinner. We need to confess that we're sinners in order to accept God's forgiveness. God doesn't just hand out forgiveness to everybody and they put it in their back pocket and then when they die they go to heaven because God is a forgiving, loving God. That's not how it works. He, he expects us. He, he, he is forgiving and he is loving and he's offered his forgiveness but he's expecting us to accept it. And in order to accept it we have to, we have to humble ourselves. Accepting the reality of hell does not make God vengeful. Just because there's a hell doesn't mean God's angry. It doesn't, it doesn't, mean, it doesn't mean he's vengeful. He's, he doesn't want to get back at you. Because what he really wants is for you to accept his forgiveness and spend eternity with him. 
People will tell you that. Your God is hateful. He is so vengeful. He created hell to throw us all in there because he's really ticked at us. And that's not true. That's not true. The truth is that hell is necessary because God's holy and he's just. And his nature demands that evil be punished. That's why hell's necessary. So similarly to the cross was necessary because God's merciful nature demanded that salvation be offered. He had to offer salvation because of his nature. And he has to offer hell because of his nature. He's holy and he's just he's, and he's, he's moral and pure. These things have to happen. So since everyone falls short of God's glory, his standard, then we all deserve death. We all deserve hell. So there's three points that you want to remember in connection to this. This will help you remember this stuff. First, God is good. He is good. He's righteous, gracious, and merciful. That's who God is. God is good. The second point, man is free. Man is free. They're informed. God has presented himself throughout history. God is in creation. God is all around us. He's not hiding somewhere. Man is informed, but uh, they're uh, violated. <laughs> they, we choose. <laughs> Man is free. We can choose, and man is fallen. We've all sinned. Number three, therefore judgment is fair. Because God is good, and because man is free, judgment is fair. Judgment. You know what's unfair? You know what's really unfair? Is that anybody at all is going to be in heaven. That's unfair. Because we shouldn't be. None of us should be in heaven. None of us. The biggest surprise when we get to heaven is that we're going to be there. None of us should. We deserve death. We deserve eternal punishment. That's what's not fair. It's not, it's not that God allows people to go to hell. At the final judgment, one thing will be very clear. God is fair. And God is merciful. And God is just. There you go. The opportunity to enter God's holy presence illustrates his mercy and grace. Jonathan Edwards says this. Tis dreadful... Tis awful, but it's true. He's talking about hell. It's dreadful, it's awful, but it's true. John 3, 19 to 21. John 3, 19 to 21. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. People love the darkness rather than the light because their works are evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light, does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. The Bible states that people love darkness rather than light. The Bible says Jesus is the only way into heaven. Recognition of what the Bible teaches about hell reveals a high view of Christ. If you don't understand the Bible's view of hell, then you don't understand who Christ is. If you have a light view of hell, if, if you take hell like it's kind of a, oh, I like to go there with all my friends because we're going to have a barbecue. If you take hell as a, your view is light, then your view of Christ is light. If you take hell seriously and you understand, you understand eternal torment, then you have, a, you have a high view of hell. You will have a very high view of Christ. Do you understand that? If hell isn't that bad, then Christ's death wasn't that much of a big deal. But if hell is, is, if hell is as bad as the word of God says so, oh, did he write that? I thought I wrote that. Think lightly of hell, and you will think lightly of the cross. Think lightly of the sufferings of lost souls, and you will soon think little of the Savior who delivers them. Charles Spurgeon, Jesus. You know, you read so much, and you think you're, you're a genius. It was him. It's true. You, if, you don't think, if you don't think much of hell, you don't really care for the lost sinners. You don't care for these people walking around on their way to hell because you know hell's not that bad. But if you have a healthy view of hell like the Bible teaches and you know that's eternal torment and there's nothing worse than that and, and it being separated from God for eternity, if, if, if that is important to you, then lost souls are important to you. Don't take, the, don't take hell lightly, 
because you'll just take the cross lightly. You don't want to do that. Those who fail to accept Christ's payment for their sins will go to hell. It's that simple. It's that simple. Heaven and hell are very real places. Both of them are very real places. What you think about hell is what you think about heaven. So, so if you think hell is no big deal, then heaven is no big deal. When you think about hell, when you think about the rewards that you're going to receive in heaven, we talk about rewards in heaven. You know, there's going to be, there's going, some are going to get into heaven as though escaping through the flame. They're just making it. Others are going to get into heaven, and, and, and Christ is going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. There's different rewards. There's different levels. We talk about crowns with jewels. I, I don't know about that. The Bible doesn't explain that enough. But apparently there's different levels of reward. Same with hell. When people get to hell, whatever you think of heaven is, what, is what's happening in hell. In hell, there's different, there's different levels of punishment. You, you mean it can be worse than we've been talking about? No, absolutely. Absolutely. Don't take these things lightly. This is, this is a huge thing. Whether a person will be in heaven or hell after death will depend on whether they choose to accept God's gift and follow Jesus. Simple as that. That's what the Bible teaches. About, about this most serious of subjects, it is the followers of Jesus, it's our privilege and duty to proclaim what God has clearly revealed. Hope is found in salvation through Jesus Christ alone. We have to proclaim that. We have to let people know where they're going to hell and we didn't do anything to help save them. And I think, I think one of the reasons that we don't talk to people about, about this serious matter is because we don't take hell seriously enough. And a lot of us in North America, man, we're not even talking about hell anymore. It's uncomfortable. It makes people uncomfortable. We don't talk about hell. We don't want to upset them. We don't want to talk about sin. Ooh, that's nasty. If you don't talk about that, how are people going to understand? How are they going to understand that they don't want hell? They want heaven. Interesting. The reality of hell. I'm thinking of making a series. Let's do question and answer period now. We're going to turn off the camera. <laughs>